Want to find out what's going on in your community? El Observador is San Jose's bilingual weekly newspaper. Go to your local newsstand and pick up your free copy today. Looking for the training and skills you need to get a new career? Call Center for Training and Careers today. That's CTC at 408-213-0961 and start building your new career today. I'm Siwapili Rose Amador Lebeau, and this is Native Voice TV. Welcome to the show. Today we have with us Randy Pico. Welcome, Randy. Hey, Em. Thank you. And I want to learn all about your tribe and about the powwows and about your profession. So let's start off. Give me a little bit of background about your tribe and your family. Uh, my family's from the Pechanga Indian Reservation. It's a reservation in Riverside County in Southern California. Um, it was uh, started in about 1882. Uh, we're Luceno Indians, Bayamequich is what we call ourselves in our language, uh, Western most people. But Luceno mm -hmm. comes from the, uh, the mission in San Luis Rey where um, um, some of the family are still uh, we're laid to rest there. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, if you go in a museum in, the, in there, you, you'll hear my voice there. So I'm, I'm very proud I get to speak for the folks in the museum there. But uh, we're from uh, primarily what's now called Pechanga. Okay, so the tribe isn't isn't called the Pechanga tribe. It's this, the uh, reservation. Yes, um, in Southern California, you have seven bands of, of Luceno from Saboba, Pechanga, Paula, Rincon, Palma, La Jolla, mm, okay. and 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 the, the the members or the the people that were put there in those days in and around 1882 time frame, all the reservations started a little different. But often, I'm a landowner on multiple reservations because families were actually split up, and so, yeah. so you know, e e even for someone like me, I, I have land on Paula, I have land on Pechanga because uh, the, the marriages and the split ups from the beginning happened. Uh, um, so yes. Okay, so you were raised there. For the most part, my family, my grandfather uh, Daniel Pico was chairman of the band. Um, for about 30 years. Mm -hmm. and he was also the head of the Mission Indian Federation, which is sort of the representing group at the time for all 37 tribes or bands in Southern California. I think he figured out it a long time ago that, uh, that it's good to have a, a place on the reservation and off the reservation. Mm -hmm. And um, so we always had homes in two areas. Paris, which is the old Indian school before Sherman, there was an Indian school in Paris, Paris, California and on the Pechanga Reservation. So we've always retain, maintained homes on the reservation and um, really until probably uh, 1978 always mm -hmm. there was a period when we had homes often on the reservation. Now what do the numbers look like as far as enrollments with your tribe? You know I, I'm not one to quote exact enrollment numbers. Mm -hmm. I would just say that you know Pechanga is, is, is you know, like most of the bands are roughly uh, certainly not nowhere near the 50,000 plus historica would tell you, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, probably in and around a thousand or so. Again, Small. I'm not one to quote the exact numbers, but yeah. these are not large bands. Right, um, right. You know. Now your family goes way back to a new Jim Thorpe. Oh well, well um, I'm very fortunate that that uh, um, I'm, I'm from a I'm from the Nesquik clan. Uh, my dad was actually uh, Pachanga on both sides. His mother Yuak and his father. Uh, Nesquik. So no, from the very first people that went, came to Pechanga, uh, Candler and Nesquik, her, her daughter Virginia became Virginia Pico, and um, and from them Carlos and Dan and my dad and those folks. And so, um, pretty historical with the band, I, I would say. And uh, no, what I have here is uh, uh, back in the day, uh, uh, Carlos, my grandfather, as well as my dad's uncle Louis Flores, played football at Carlisle back in Pennsylvania for. For um, for Pop Warner, 
um, and they played, you know, of course, with Jim Thorpe, and they were in that era there. And this is this is Lewis here. Um, and this, what I have here, is something that the Smithsonian's been trying to get from us. Is what is that? This Hold is actually this is actually the the, the pants that uh, they wore in the football games. These are wood oh. pads, and you can still see blood from the from the battles. But these are the they, you know they played against um, uh, the USC's, the armies, and navies. I remember of the world. seeing those kind of pants in the old football pictures. Yeah, this is the real deal from from wow. Carlisle. And there's not a lot of Carlisle stuff left. I guess the the campus burned some number of years ago. Oh my so. goodness, that's that is really a a piece to cherish there. What is it? Is that leather? What is that made it's out of? It's actually canvas, much like canvas. what you see an old tent. And uh, um, my guess is, you know, they didn't play with helmets in those days. It was pretty pretty rugged. But uh, Pop Warner, uh, after he left Carlisle, he came over here to Stanford, and um, and so you know, uh, my my dad's uncle got to sit on the sidelines when Stanford was at the Rose Bowl back in the day, and so. It's just oh a, uh, but it does have a, I brought this because it does tie into the powwow, and mm -hmm. we talk about the origins of the powwow. Uh, I think it starts at Carlisle. And your family, your father has been involved or was involved with the powwows. Uh, he started it at Pechanga, or how did that go about? Well, powwow for at, at Pechanga, I would say at Carlisle, when the folks were at Carlisle, they came back and they had seen that kind of dance styles. Mm -hmm. And then um, in the area of Southern California, there's a pageant, Ramona pageant. And, um, and I have pictures of my grandfather and his brother dancing at the pageant, sort of um, what you would call powwow style of dance. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was a kid, uh, it's funny to say, but um, the um, uh, Knott's Berry Farm would uh, let the young natives in for free if we would dance and sing, and so some of us would do that. And, and as a way to, you know, get in, you know, uh -huh. we were, uh, we were, we were pretty um, dirt floors and outhouses sort of thing. So that was something that we could do. Um, and then we had some of the family members that had been lived back in Oklahoma or Missouri, uh -huh. and so they would dance on the reservation, sort of powwow style. People would come out and just kind of watch. Uh -huh. But the formal organized powwow in, in that is uh, what, what, what people see today really started a, a gonna, gonna be, oh, this will be our 20th year next year. Right. And, um, and you know, really it started with a, you know, 50, 50 folks there and um, sacking on grant, bringing in the flag and my dad is a head gourd dancer. Kind of really small from that, that beginning, mm -hmm. uh, people that have seen powwow style dancing. For me personally, uh, my first powwow I think was in 1973. My my aunt had married a gentleman who was one of the premier MCs at that time in California. His name was Melvin Logan, and Melvin was her uncle. and And I remember going to a powwow in '73 and and seeing Melvin or Chalk Logan. And you know, it's funny because the sign said "Live Indians" this way. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and it stuck out of my mind. I still had the brochure from it for as a kid. And and wow. then and then um, <laughs> yes. And, and, and but our power Pachanga has evolved from a, a you know that small on dirt, you know to what it is today, and uh, I, I I think it's a very special event. It is. It's I really enjoyed it. Now has it grown with the casino being there? Did that give it a big a boost? Yeah. Had it not been for the casino, we wouldn't probably have this this organized event that way. Uh, the Pachanga Resort and Casino is arguably, um, I, or without a doubt, one of the largest. The large resort in the West Coast, and mm -hmm. so it's a beautiful resort. Um, and um, the powwow grounds that people dance on are, are groomed by the same people that do the golf course, and, wow. and, and it's just for that purpose. Right. And so it's it is a major event. You know, on the last few years, depending on the weather, we can get between sixty and seventy thousand people showing up. Uh, this year we had about a thousand dancers, and uh, we've been very fortunate though to have. Uh, you know, great MCs like Tom Phillips mm -hmm. and and others there to really support the event. Uh, this year we had Billy Mills there, which was wonderful. Yeah, I got to meet him. I was so excited. <laughs> yeah, so it it really has become, um, a, uh, for lack of better words, a bit of a homecoming for a lot of people to come have a good time together. As many powers. How are. long has the casino been there? You know, the casino uh, really started um, about a year before the power started. So the casino was starting around '93, '94 mm -hmm. sort of time frame. And it, you know, it, it started with, think of a double white trailer that just started and uh, that kind of grew and grew and grew. Uh, it's beautiful. It is really fantastic. I was so impressed when I saw it. Both the powwow and the casino and just the whole, the grounds, it's just beautiful. 
It seems like it yeah. even gets nicer every year, just a little additions. You know, for those like me who kind of grew up around there, and you know, and I, I, I graduated from college and, and sort of left the living permanently in the area, but my family, my mother still lives there, everybody mm -hmm. lives there. Um, it's just been a tremendous, um, uh, to see it from, you know, from that, <laughs> from that moment when it first started, you mm -hmm. know, everybody, <laughs> It was uh, go over there and eat, and you know, even our dogs would run over there to eat for free. <laughs> it was, uh, it was just, uh, it really started from from very humble beginnings, uh -huh. but um, through the efforts of a very incredible uh, leadership at the band um, to do to do that, and you know, sort of expect that. Pachanga has sort of always been there when when things matter for for Indian people, and ah, and, and so they try to do it right. That it. Fantastic job. Now, you've, you're a gore dancer and an announcer and an arena director. You've done it all. Tell me about how you got into all of that. Well, I really, originally, um, um, I think I like a lot of Californians in that era in the 70s. We were watching a lot, you know. Um, and uh, uh, my dad, he was inducted into the Golden State Gourd Society uh, along with um, Ben Knight Horace Campbell. They were inducted together. I wanted to sing for him, you know. So for many years, I was a southern singer and would sing on the drum. And then uh, I think uh, around '93, '94, uh, I'm also a member of the American Indian Science and Engineering Society, a large uh, society for American Indians in science and technology. A national conference coming to San Jose, and I wanted to organize it. And so I, I got involved with organizing it. And, and really, in the last 20 years, I've been involved with organizing or emceeing or arena directing judging and recently being inducted into the Gort Society. Ah, I, I've heard, I've seen and heard you at the different powwows and very impressed. It, it, it really takes a special knack like you and Tom that just can keep the conversation going and know when to talk, when not to talk and know the history to be explaining things as it goes. And um, very impressive, very impressive. Now tell me, um, let's talk a little bit about your professional career because that I'm very impressed by and I think that our youth need to know mm -hmm. more, that there are Native people like you. Tell us about your career. Well, I think that was <laughs> my grandfather. Again, everything goes back to the family and my grandfather, uh, he had graduated from a, a, a technical school after World War II and he went to a school called DeVry, DeVry Institute of Technology. Perfect. And he got his degree in electronics. But he never told anybody, bless his heart. And um, he actually was a laborer. He led the tribe and led the bands. Washington, I have, I, you know, I have letters from Washington that, I, that he was a wonderful, great man. I'm very, you know, very blessed to be around him. But he didn't tell anybody. When I graduated from high school, he told me the secret. He said, you know, I graduated from college. It's your birthright to be, to be a scientist, engineer, or, you know, understand who, who Paula Ekla, the forces of nature. Mm -hmm. and he, at that point, it sort of instilled, it's my birthright. I'm going to go to college and do this. And so I went to the same school, graduate electronics engineering, and was recruited out of college because of my high GPA um, to work at Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. And, you know, the journey's been 30 years later, uh, two degrees later, <laughs> a lot of technical certificates from the UCLA's and Berkeley's of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, I am the senior superintendent for the engineering directorate, which is uh, a director of about 1,600 people of which I get to influence those folks, but mainly the thousand people that are technicians and technologists there at the lab. What do they do at the lab? I've always heard of the lab, but really don't, I don't know what they do there. I think the main thing that Lawrence Livermore Laboratory does is big science. You know, we tackle some of those, the biggest, most challenging problems for the, for the, for the nation, for the government, both in, in the Homeland Security area, as well as, um, as uh, research in weapons and fusion. Uh, the next energy sources. I always say I'm, I'm very much been witness to the next paradigm shifts in the way people are going to live. Uh, the, those changes in technology and um, everything from, you know, we have the world's most powerful, biggest, fastest computer to the, uh, to the world's most powerful laser beams in the world. In fact, they made a movie, the last Star Trek movie was made there because they, they used some of the film of, of some of our equipment there. It's the it's one square mile of the most educated uh, again, arguably the most educated uh, 3,000 PhDs. It's, there's no other concentration of that kind of uh, PhDs in the world that, that Lawrence Summer has. And 
kids, you could do this too. Where would someone start? What age should they start thinking about this? Absolutely. Um, STEM should start in the beginning. I mean, I, I just, uh, my dream, my vision has always been, I, you know, um, young people of color, American Indians. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Einstein studied with a Hopi and, you know, at that point, because as natives we have this uh, in, in, in inalienable right and birthright to study our nature and study things around us and the environment and, and how we live in it. And so I know I get romantic about that, but that's true. I, I believe that in my heart. And so um, don't be shy. Um, ask questions. Um, consider your birthright uh, to study science, engineering, STEM, um, science, technology, math, and, um, and uh, just love it. Be passionate about it. And I guess if you, the kids could relate to Star Trek and things of that nature, and because you know, so many of the kids think, "Oh, I can't do that," or it's uh, that's something you know that someone else does. But if they can relate to, I could start working on it now, you know, in grade school and keeping my grades up and keeping you know in tune with all these subjects, then you know they can start working towards that goal. And it's it's not always about becoming a PhD. It's 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 you know, I, I was a technician, technologist when I started, so I had, uh, I believed I had good hands-on skills, you know, I could take something apart, work on that car, work on that radio. It's not always to have to be somebody that can learn calculus or the highest levels of physics, or, but, but you working with your hands in science and technology, there's, there's multiple levels in this, and I, I, I uh, I've been on reservations and seen guys change a tire with no machines in, in less than 15 minutes. And I've, I've seen people make engineering things just to do it. I'm Nesca clan, and that's translated as a tool maker. So oh, okay. it, I, when my grandfather reinforced my birthright, I felt like I can do this. And, you know, and that's the other thing, too, when you look at, you know, people, a lot of people of color stay away from... Well, you, you look at Mexica and you look at the, the Aztecs and the numbers and they were so far advanced in astronomy and math and then kids are afraid of it now. You know, it's like, it is your birthright. You know, you have this in your, in your genes, you have this in your history. Right. You know, don't shy away from it. That was for me. I mean, I, I was literally somebody who, um, it's phenomenal how out of high school, um, I just didn't believe I could go to college. I just didn't think it was anywhere in my scope of ever attaining that. And uh, when the recruiter actually came out to the res, and I, I joked that he'd entered a foreign land to recruit this <laughs> young man, and then my grandfather told me the story, and I, I'm always gonna go back to I felt like I belong in this. And then when I got in class, I just wanted to be the best, and a few 4.0s later, and, and uh, I'm here. Wow, well, congratulations, and let's keep working on the kids. We gotta keep recruiting them and yes, Rose. bringing them along. Yes, Rose, we do. Yeah, and anything I can do to help with, you know. And I, in fact, when you did do the um, convention here, we had someone come on the show and talk about it too. It was a while back. So where do you see the future of um, the uh, your powwow? Well, we're gonna. Uh, we're, we're, I see the future of the power. I, I'm, I'm very hopeful that uh, uh, powers uh, sorts such as Pachanga will even. I mean, the power portion of it is 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 that that uh, dancing that we're getting apart. Mm -hmm. uh, many would say that the gore dancing is a separate entity that kind of uh, joins it in, in in just the right way. That we're really fortunate to see in California, which you go up to Oregon, you might not see that, but mm -hmm. in California, you have that. You're very enriched by that southern style of the gore dancing, and then the powwow. I'm hoping more and more uh, to, to have the bird dancers, the local bird singers, uh, California Indians uh, feel really, really, really comfortable in doing some of their dance styles. It might not be part of the powwow, but it might be somehow joined to it. And, and at Pachanga, we have peon dancing, or peon games, not peon dancing, peon games. We have bird dancing and bird singing. But really, you know, I could see the day of having a head bird singer and a head bird dancer there. I hope that, yeah. and then and then always keeping in mind. Certainly at Pachanga, one of the the biggest goals there is to have the drums and the head staff have some really ties to this California community. Uh, like yourself, Rose, you're out there, but you have a big responsibility as a role model because of the visibility. And when we get those people that have those responsibilities at an event like that, we're recognizing them within our community, and I I just think that's so valuable. 
Absolutely. And do you think enough youth are being groomed to take over? Because, you know, the, the day that you say, okay, I'm retiring from this, or I need to pass it on, are we training enough youth? You know, um, <laughs> one MC to another, I, I, I am an MC, um, um, but, uh, you know, the, the premier MCs like Tom and, and the folks like that, and you have Ron Laconi in California and others, um, all of us from my vantage are, are welcoming others, working with others. Um, you got to really, you, you'll know when they really want that responsibility. It, it's certainly one thing to be a reading director, but uh, I'm not going to kid you, Rose, it's, a, it's tough. Mm -hmm. And as, as, a, as a wonderful uh, MC told me, um, you can never pay us enough. It's really, <laughs> it's not about the money. It's, it's, it's about the love and passion for the people Absolutely. and the love and passion for the moment. And, and uh, when that next generation is ready and they're, they're, they're coming, uh, we're going to be there to help them out. I'm sure I will be, and I'm sure Tom, and I, I can only speak for myself, but I'm sure all those others will represent those folks well. That's good. And it's, it's, it, I think it all boils down to being, you know, in a leadership role, in a role model role, and you know when someone's ready to take on that responsibility because they'll step forward themselves. I am still learning a lot. You know, even after 20 years of doing those kinds of things, uh, there's, there's, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a continuous journey. I bet it is. Um, let's see what I want to talk to you about. When we, we, we're focusing on youth, um, what message would you give to youth? Uh, the message that I that I like the youth to know is is to, um, you know, it, maybe it's a tough message for youth, but I want keep open minded about what's out there. You know, if 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 you if someone's teaching you something and and you don't get it. Um, you don't give up. Try and figure it out another way. You know, it's another book might teach you how to do it. Be persistent. Um, um, one of the most interesting things for me is I remember when I went to college. I, my best friend was Val Victorian, and 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 when I was in high school, and I didn't know how to study. So until I learned how to study, you know, I wrote Pueblo, Colorado, and they sent me all these free books on how to study, and it helped me. So ask for help. Um, keep an open mind to all these new concepts, and and enjoy it. You know, it's. Um, that feeling like you try to have the same feeling like when you go to Powell, you know, you go to Powell and you just feel so enriched and so happy to be there and there's good feelings around it. Have those in school too. Try to, you know, try to get to that place and, and it'll be, it'll be much better for you. That, that's such a good message. You know, and it's so important too, I think, for our youth to not give up because they have a fa failure and they want to say, you know, okay, that's it, I give up, I can't do it. They could get up and try again. They could try something else. They can, it's not the end of the world, you know, and so many of them give up so young. I, I'm hopeful that, um, you know, resources, people, um, I, 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 I think there's a lot, of, a lot more people that want to help and we, we, we got to be willing to, to ask, ask for help and, and yes. be willing to help and so. That's so, so true. There's so many people willing to help. And, and there's probably not enough programs. I know we still have a very high dropout rate, unfortunately, amongst the kids and just with high school. So, you know, we're trying to push them past high school into college and keep going. But even the ones who dropped out, I say, go back. I know, I know some people who have, and they're, you know, Native people who've gone back after dropping out. They go back at their GED, then they go to college. And one, a friend of mine, so he's a PhD now, but he dropped out. Mm -hmm. So he didn't give up just because he dropped out. He said, mm -hmm. no, I'm going back. I'll get my GED. I'll go back to college. And, and he did. And one of the things that I've learned with one of the programs we have, it's a GED program. Mm -hmm. And it's for kids who are behind in units or got expelled or had some problems in school. We've had the highest number of graduates with honors, which means they were smart to begin exactly. with. Exactly. No, exactly. I, 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 I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm also encouraged right now is we have a lot of post, American Indians still join the military in very large amounts, and post 9-11 veterans have educational benefits, and I'm really hoping that they would use those to go to, you know, within that program to go to school and, and help those be successful as well. Um, you know, that's one of the beauties of California is we have so many museums and stuff here and uh, uh, that take advantage of those things, take advantage of those things and, and help get those youth, ins youth inspired by that. Absolutely. Now, are there tri uh, reservation, are there schools on your reservation? 
Yes, Pechanga does school? have. I mean, do Pech you have your own schools? Pechanga does have an elementary school there. Okay. Um, and they teach Liseño there for the students. Oh, wonderful. Um, Southern California, Saboba has Noli. There are, um, now that's not common on reservations in California, certainly. Right, I know. Um, but some of the ones, some of the tribes, uh, the bands can, can do that. Um, and and it's, they've been very successful from what I understand, certainly. Oh, that's great. Well, hopefully you can get your STEM programs incorporated in, if you haven't already done that with your, on your own schools. Absolutely, uh, yes, I'm, um, I'm looking forward to doing that. And we have MESA program in the state of California, mm -hmm. which is a wonderful program, which is, um, which is on the reservations I'm from Round Valley to Southern California. You'll see those programs, or have seen those programs. And I'm, I'm still very much encouraged by that. But if you can think of the Bay Area only getting 3% getting technical diplomas or degrees recently, that really, the reservations, it would be even lower. So it's not just uh, the bands and tribes. It's, you know, I would say, California in general. I know. <laughs> it's bad. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being here, and I appreciate all the work you do for our community. And keep it up, and we're there to help you out, too. It's an honor to be here. Thank you much Thanks for the work for you do. Thanks for being here. And thank you for watching this show. Don't forget, we're on YouTube. We're on uh, Facebook. All of you are on Facebook. So <laughs> follow us on Facebook as we'll have pictures of the shoot. And then we'll have the show actually on YouTube. We're in quite a few different uh, cities now. And I had a list of them, but I left the list someplace else. <laughs> but we're uh, pretty much all over California. We're in Hawaii. We're in uh, a couple other states. And we're expanding every, every month or so. So we want you to keep following us and you can go to nativevoicetv.org. You can catch some of our shows that we uh, put on the website and find our contact information and anything you want to talk to us about. So uh, stay in touch with us and thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Good night.